Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Ludo Narracom panel, uh, when social is part of narrative. Uh, I am Samuel Partridge. I am the studio lead of Tribuji Games, when we recently released King of the Castle. I'm going to pass over to Richard Bartle. Do you like to introduce yourself? Hello. Yes, I'm uh, Richard Bartle. I'm Professor of Computer Game Design at the University of Essex. Um, my background is massively multiplayer online role-playing games, which I've been working on for longer than you, um, for most definitions of you. Uh, that's pretty well who I am. I'll uh, pass on to May, I think, now. Yes, thank you, Richard. Uh, so my name is May. I'm lead game designer at Interior Night, and we released our first game at Dust4 on Xbox and Steam last year. So it is our first game, um, so we learn a lot from that. So at Dust4 is an original interactive drama game with a lot of branching narrative. Um, so you make choices for the playable character, and then you can play up to eight player together. And then I'm going to pass it to Yu Yi. Thanks, May. Uh, I'm Yu Yu. Um, I'm a narrative designer and a producer at uh, Infinity Wise. Uh, my background is actually in board games, which motivated me to make a multiplayer murder mystery game with Press in the West. Um, last year, I also uh, worked on uh, another game and released it on Netflix platform, uh, Rings Three Kingdoms. Cracking. So not only is that a really good panel of experts, really well introduced, better than myself, <laughs> I am thoroughly intimidated, uh, <laughs> and I think it's going to be a good one. Um, why don't I pick up the first question from our little list and pass it over to May. So, uh, and then May, if you take the next one, we'll work through it like that. How does that sound? Sounds good. Good. So May, congratulations. Uh, you were nominated for a BAFTA this year. Uh, for players who haven't uh, followed As Dust Falls closely, can you intro the game? did a little bit of it there, but especially go into detail about how the multiplayer mode works. Yes, thank you. So, yeah, it was an honour for us to be nominated for BAFTA debate game. Um, so, if you don't know Dust Falls already, so as I mentioned before, it's the kind of uh, originally interactive drama game. The story takes place in America with Midwest and begin with um, two family like Wins Walker, his family like driving food across America to their new home and then when they get to the motel they get into a hot stage situation. And then in the game what we really want is to have an impactful and story and then it's like kind of related to the player so they can like use the normal that, so the story is not like kind of like sci-fi or anything. It's something that for player to understand about like how the character emotion and how they actually um, they can use their own emotion and what they know in the normal time to actually kind of like solving uh, the character questions. Um, so from the play, multiplayer point, multiplayer point of view is as I say it's a mix uh, local multiplayer and online multiplayer you can play like four player in one places four player in other places what we want is that like, player can actually meet together and play the game from the local multiplayer you can play a player in the sofa what we want is that like, they can discussing the choices they make choice and then through the discussion they can like come up with a better solution for the character um, and then also like we try to make it as accessible as possible so it means that uh, our control is really simple you can like just using we also like have a phone controller so you can actually download a phone app so you can use it as a controller because like who will have a controller at home um, so it means that because it's like such a simple control mean that you can invite more people who may not normally play game to actually play it. Um, we also have like Twitch integration. So I mean, I mean, like you know about it, like Sam, because like you have it in the Kings of the Castle. Uh, that's why it's uh, similar. So you can actually um, on the what uh, on the test chat, you can actually type in the choices then the player have like 30 seconds so you can like have like waiting for everyone to vote um, 
because it's a voting mechanic, so it's a majority will win. It means that um, it would be like half like people bantering, try to like put like kind of encouraging different people to make the choices. For me, the interesting thing when watching like people like doing user testing on the Twitch um, the session is a lot of time is that like, how people um, put really like how they like, put in a lot of their uh, feeling and try to like shape the character and learn more about the character. Wrecking. So yeah, it really is so. when social meets narrative, huh? Yeah. yeah, so speaking of uh, Twitch integration, Sam, I know you just released a game which largely targeting towards a Twitch audience. Would you like to introduce King of the Castle? I didn't really do that in my intro, did I? Not a good job, huh? <laughs> <laughs> King of the Castle, so it is a, a multiplayer narrative game, a social narrative game, uh, which you one person takes the role of a monarch, and then four to four thousand is the tagline, but we can go higher than that. Play as nobles in a council that uh, vote on certain decisions, that can get involved in buildings, that can be taxed. Uh, and it has two modes. There's a party game mode for two to 24 people, which you can uh, join for free on a browser. Very similar, sounds like to As Dust Falls. And we can plug it into Twitch as well. And then Twitch chat can vote inside of um, the chat as well as appear as characters in the story we pull in their avatars uh you play through a couple of we divide people up into regions they're each scheming against the monarch we do a, a procedure generated semi-procedure generated narrative based off it uh where the state of the kingdom determines which events pop up that's the core of it yeah it is uh uh, also on sale in uh in Ludonaricom right now not uh, as of the time this recording comes out how was that? Did that explain it? It's a, it's, a, it's a big, meaty concept. Yeah, I always find the Twitch integration fascinating. There are so many games nowadays trying to uh, grab the audience of either Twitch streamers or uh, Twitch uh, players who view contents on Twitch regularly. But there are, I have seen like so many different approach in terms of uh, Twitch integration as well. And... Uh, um, yeah, Whispers in the West, as I mentioned in the intro, it's a multiplayer murder mystery game. Um, in fact, when I say that, it's actually a game that also supports single player mode as well, but we just really take pride of the online co-op element of it. Um, so we had this idea of uh, a multiplayer murder mystery game, because partly because my background was in board games. Uh, also because um, everyone in my team, apart from myself, uh, are Gen Z. So, um, like um, watching uh, games on Twitch or playing uh, f uh, games with friends virtually and remotely, it's just the, uh, the, the way, like the, the way naturally they, they grew up, grew up with. So, um, it, it wasn't, a, a big, big decision for us to actually go for an online co-op game, because given the success of indie games like Phasmophobia. Um, but I guess we are still getting there in terms of how to uh, meaningfully engage Twitch audience and uh, um, encourage the, the interaction between Twitch hosts and their um, followers as well. Yeah, it, it definitely is the newest act on the scene for social narrative and it has a lot of possibilities in it as well like it, it is very new and untested ground we found that when we were developing king of the castle we had to rethink most of our assumptions about how games worked you know on this massive scale where pe people are playing simultaneously it's very different uh, but that being said like we do have one person here who like he said has been doing this for a long time and i certainly learned a lot from reading up on and playing MUD. Uh, to be fair, Richard, could you introduce MUD to some of our audience uh, that may not know what it is? Because it is uh, just, I mean, it, it, it's the multiplayer game in my opinion. Uh, okay, well, yes, it is a museum piece. So, you know, I'm, a, it, I'm like the curator <laughs> wandering around the, uh, this, these are the dinosaurs. In fact, I'm probably one of the dinosaurs. Um, okay, so um, MUD was um, the, the first virtual world um, uh, 
persistent shared um, environment that you act with and interact with through the medium of a character. So all today's virtual worlds, uh, by which I mean well, World of Warcraft, Final Fantasy XIV, Guild Wars 2, even things like Second Life, um, EverQuest 2, I mean, they all ultimately come from MUD, or there's about four or five other um, reinventions of the concept, because it's not like it takes a genius to do it, although obviously it did, but um, but it wasn't um, something that we... Uh, uh, I invented it with Roy Trubshaw, he, he sort of started it, um, when we were undergraduates at a university. So th the thing is, this was in 1978, <clears throat> which is why I have white hair. Um, <laughs> well, I've that on no hair, but... Um, back then, um, <clears throat> there weren't any multiplayer games around like this. Um, uh, certainly not what we'd call massively multiplayer now. It was all text-based because we didn't have graphics till about 1980 on our university um, but because of that I made it easy to add things to it because there was no need to get assets it, you could just describe it all in text so um, that's pretty well where I come from really good timing for my lights to fall down midway through <laughs> that I'm really sorry everyone yes, I'm amateur well. streamer alert <laughs> I think I've caught maze COVID <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, we should say one of our panellists is a little bit under the weather, May. Um, thank you so much for, for joining us uh, despite that. Uh, Richard, I do want to say as well that um, it was particularly exciting to talk to you because I worked for Fail Better Games mm -hmm. on Fallen London uh, previous to this. Uh, and with the quality-based narrative system and text, kind of really a text-based game, uh, the team there certainly traced their kind of ancestry and inspiration from MUD as well. So I feel like what you started spawned basically the career that I have right now. So thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, you may have paid for my mortgage. Appreciate it. But yeah, at least you're not saying it, it, it formed my career and I should be sending assassins around your house. Which is the, the other sometimes, thing. sometimes. Yeah. A week before launch, maybe I was feeling like that. But no. Um, well, well, the narrative... The narrative we have in in mud, I mean, doesn't have an overall overarching story arc. It was it's all emergent. It's all to do with um, players have their own goals. These goals conflict with each other, or they work with each other for a while, uh, and then the drama arises from players, um, which are you know, all, all all drama comes from character, and of course, different people are different real world characters, and they're investing themselves in virtual characters that they've created. So. That amplifies everything. So, we we didn't have a narrative that was um, defined um, explicitly, but it was kind of programmed in procedurally in order to direct mm. people to behave in certain ways, which would um, lead to them having fun uh, and also lead to them not being complete jerks to everybody else. Which, which is a usual problem with multiplayer games. I don't know if you're going to be finding that, but... Oh, for sure. I mean, we, we model political systems. So when a vote takes place, there are interests uh, in the schemes to change the stats to them. There's a storyline to them as well. We tend to pit players against each other in groups of regions. And we get a lot of feedback saying, oh, it's so annoying because people are voting for the wrong thing or they're not thinking when they're voting. And you go, well, I'm not sure that's the fault of the game or is it the fault of human nature? I mean, we can say very much the same about most democracies, frankly. Do you have much problem with bots? Yes, yes and no. Um, the main... So, so we have, do you know what? If the light's going to come down twice... That is not my fault, you know. God, I have a problem with this light. Tell you what, yeah, one of you were complimenting me on my setup, and now look at this, it's very embarrassing. So Maybe it's a well, poor horror game, set up for a horror right? game. right? Oh, well, yeah, we'll see. Um, bots in the game, yes and no. The inputs are varied enough that people haven't developed very detailed bots for it. We're, we're helped that Twitch, as we piggyback off a lot of what Twitch does, Twitch's bot system is quite strict where we do see bots occur is when streamers create bots and build bots specifically for the game and on the whole 
they like to support play. They've picked this game up so they can have a good time with their audience. It's often antagonistic, yes, but there isn't that sense of I want to beat and crush as we're building a narrative together. The bots that we've seen are mostly built around that. You know, they will say to themselves, I wish I had more you know, a, a group of people are loyalists, so I wish we could boost one region, and I wish that was something in the game. So they build a bot based around that that will vote with certain players. Um, the, I suspect, however, we're only out for a couple of months, then in the next, they'll start to get more advanced, and in a, a, come and ask me in about six months' time when someone's realized that they could completely beat the game by themselves. Um, we certainly have issues with players uh, entering and leaving the game, trying to get into the region they want to, or leaving regions if they think they're going to lose. But we had predicted that and we quietly tipped the scales in favor very gently towards smaller regions and others to kind of balance out voting. And indeed our previous update, 1.1, added a new system to say that, okay, if you're alone in a region, your votes will get boosted to that of the second largest region in the game, thus balancing it out. Um, which something we're keeping an eye on though, Richard, is this something that you have experienced of? Are you warning me of some terrifying future where bots take over <laughs> King of the Castle? No, but as soon as I heard that there were votes involved, I thought, that's bots. Um, yes. And I knew that Twitch would be, uh, <coughs> would be um, on your side there, but uh, um, if, if anything just needs numbers, then you, you do have to be careful. But, uh, so that's why I was asking, but yeah, it sounds like you're on top of it, which is a good thing. Yeah, just about. Um, we, we're kind of letting enough voting weirdness from reality to step through, so you can modify votes in the game with laws, which allow you to veto certain options and switch around the voting system so the least voted on thing passed, for example. Um, and that, funnily enough, has been the most conducive thing to getting people to vote tactically and think about what they're voting for. Um, which then confuses bots as well. But uh, yeah, like I said, I suspect in a couple of months' time we'll have our first King of the Castle hacking scandal where we have to do a recount. Still, that'll be good publicity for you. Everyone will be wanting <laughs> Great to play it now. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fingers crossed. Grand, shall we push on with the rest of these questions? In fact, I've got one for Richard here. Um, you know, King of the Castle, like, role-playing games really informed uh, the design of King of the Castle, right? That The Twitch streamer is part of a comedic, sometimes antagonistic duo with their chat, but also works a lot like a DM, uh, a, a dungeon master overseeing a tabletop game where they kind of set out the rules and the fun and chat plays with them. Um, so, yes, we played a lot of D&D before we came up with uh, King of the Castle. Were you a big role-playing game, role game yourself? Did you play any TTRPGs or were, did, did MUD well, come fully formed? Well, um, as I said, it was, um, it was written by myself and Roy Trubshaw. Roy had not played yes. Dungeons & Dragons, but I had played Dungeons & Dragons. Um, but I'd been creating worlds well before then, uh, before Dungeons & Dragons came out, which came, came, I think we got our copy in 76. Um, oh, so we, um, I'd invented role-playing games, single-player ones, um, where I just wrote a diary for a character exploring a, um, a continent, um, and Dungeons and Dragons um, was great. Still my favourite uh, game, um, the original white box. But in fact, I could just reach over there and get one now if I hadn't been told to keep still. Um, but the. Uh, um, I, I didn't. I, it wasn't that that inspired me to write Mud. I'd been developing games already um, before then. Um, uh, um, most children, imaginative children, create paracosms, you know, imaginary worlds that they have and populate, and they tend to grow out of it. But I never really did because um, I wanted to make a world that was um, that you could visit, that other people could visit, that they could share. Uh, Mm. Really, because I didn't like the real world, and I thought I could do a better job. Um, uh, and even if I hadn't done a better job, the real world seems to be heading that way to make my job a better mm. one. Uh, it's it's disintegrating as we speak. Um, so, uh, I'll, I did take some ideas from Dungeons and Dragons, mainly the levels um, that I had in Mud, which I took from D and D because I knew they worked. I knew they gave people. Um, Aim um, a target to aim at some um, goals, intermediate goals, and I also wanted them to um, reflect the uh, 
the the, the strength you know, the strength of character of the player. So the um, the higher your characters level, the higher you as a player were um, as um, as experienced. But really, it was it's kind of pushed back against the British class system. I really did not like that. Um, as most people who come from working class backgrounds would agree, it's not great. So um, it was that, that was the, the political artistic statement about it. The real world sucks. I want to make a better one, and I'm going to do it. Um, so D and D was one of the things that fed in. Uh, Lord of the Rings fed in the book yeah. um, because that was um, proof of concept that you could create a world that was standalone, believable. Um, so I knew I could do it. I mean, it, well, it wasn't for the story, obviously, uh, but the um, but the world building. Um, so yeah, um, I did play some games of D and D then um, uh, as a player, but um, ultimately um, it's as a designer that I um, that I was playing it. And how about you? Do you play as a player or as a designer? D and D, uh, mostly a player. I've ran campaigns of uh, smaller games, smaller TTRPG things, things like Ten Candles, and uh, I've been trying to get the time to do a Blades in the Dark campaign. But when you're making games on the side and you're taking some time out, you don't really want to be making more games. Um, <laughs> the Yes, the role-playing element did take a great deal from this. I will admit freely that my co-founders, uh, Owen Newburn, um, the tech lead, and Harry Tufts, our narrative lead, are bigger D&D players than I am. And I'm really glad I had them on the team because they could take more inspiration, more points. Harry's writing opens up to allow players to insert themselves into narratives more than just text could do. Like you said, Richard, it's, it's what's happening in the mind and the imagination of the players. Uh, and then Owen as well knew that there was more to it than just, hey, let's just offer them an interface. So our party game has a web app, which is very much designed to be small and out of the way and keep players chatting with each other. Um, for me, really, I think we were very similar children by the sounds of it, Richard, though I had the advantage of um, of more games being out there. Being 80 and, years example, younger than me. <laughs> <laughs> I moisturize, I'm really not that much younger. <laughs> I it sounds sad, though. Yeah, no, yes, yeah, so it does. <laughs> Can't see if I can personally. Yeah, I know the audience will be, but, uh, yeah, no. Um, so um, I found a pile of notebooks that I must have made when I was about nine or ten playing a game called Rome Total War, which had just come out, you know, brand new on the shelves. And I had written out all the characters' lives in the game. Now, looking back at the game, it didn't have this in there. They were just units on a field, right? Who would be moved around. And I had instilled in them their own lives, their own stories, their own feelings, their personalities, their relationships and opinions on other characters, which wasn't modeled in the game. And I think that kind of narrative that was born from a very simple system, if you give, you know, we're, we're pattern recognizing creatures, right? You put, you know, a circle and you put two dots and an upward line on it, you see a smiley face and that face is happy. Well, it's the same with games. And for me, I, I, I really wanted to make games that not just tell a story, but allow players to have their own story in their head and tie extras into it and come up with the meta and kind of, you know, the law of the world is the fashionable term for it. Do you know, like, um, so I watched one of the Steam about like King of the Castle the other day. I was actually really impressed because I think the person I watched was the, the second term. So mm -hmm. they played the second time. So the beginning, he was like spending like 10 minutes or maybe more than 10 minutes, just like how like explaining that like, what happened in the last session. It's such a good way of nice like, storytelling because like, he was like explaining like what had been happening we were like saying oh he must be like looking down everything in a notebook or something in order to remember all the thing happened but the thing about it is like as you say it's like have a creation of the story when you play the game and then able to do the storytelling bit as well to explaining it it's like the the really magical i thought was like really nice about it Oh, well, thank you very much. Uh, yeah. I, I, I'm really pleased with it. We're overwhelmingly positive on Steam now, which is just such an 
on a and, a, and, and like you said, I, I, looking through those reviews, most of which are people explaining what they did inside the game. We, we laid out the structure and the foundation. They went in with a paintbrush and built the world themselves. I, I couldn't be happier. Um, in fact, May, while, while I have you, I, I have a question for, for you as well. What, what motivated you to work uh, in and around multiplayer games as well? I think we've talked a bit about both of Richard and mine's motivations, but I'm really interested in, in, in yours. Yeah, I think, <clears throat> so I played game when I was a kid with my family. Um, so I'm like one of the six, so I got like five oh, siblings. Wow. Um, oh, so when I was a kid, um, a lot of time, like my parents working, so we just playing game together. So by playing game, it's like kind of like we sharing the memory, and it's something very social about about like you able to share a game together. So when I grow up, like that that memory is always stuck into my mind that I want something that is a local co-op because I think I mean I I play online online multiplayer game, but in a way, I still can't really like the idea about like sitting next to your friend or family mm. when playing. Um, so when I looking at it again, like uh, so, even in at Dust Four, we got like eight player multiplayer mode. I think it's like, such a nice thing that you can play with your friends or family. Um, and then previous game I did is like have a, a game called iToy, an iPad. Um, they also like have having multiplayer sessions. I mean, they're quite um, family friendly games. So for me, it's like how we can like sharing experience and then have like fun together, really. Because I think game is should be fun and then able to interact with other people. Uh, it's a cool thing. So in at Dust Four, as I say, you can play a local multiplayer as well as like mix online and local so it means that like even though i'm in uk now but i could play on that multiplayer with my family in hong kong oh, great have you um, played uh, your games you've worked on with your family yeah i did oh, it's really cool you liked it i mean yes <laughs> i mean it's because we also do localization so we do have a chinese version so it means oh, that i could great. just uh, <laughs> playing <laughs> with them i mean it's is not because it's not really long game. Uh, it does for we got like six episode, one hour each. So it's like quite a nice, um, episodic length that you could like been watching, maybe been playing for like maybe two session of your session together. Um, but yeah, I think it's when when you are. I mean, especially last few year been a pandemic. Um, so I think having multiplayer game together is a really nice breakthrough. Was was it an easy decision to make though? Uh, because as Dusk for obviously, you don't have to have this multiplayer mode, and uh, to build this multiplayer feature, you obviously need to inv invest a lot of time and resources. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's definitely it's a big decision because I mean, like, in traditionally, when you do a uh, narrative game, it's mainly solo experience because mm -hmm. it's a kind of a personal like, journey. But um, but for us, I think actually in the really beginning, we already like have decided we really want to have a multiplayer mechanic in it. Um, I think one of the things we talk about before, like even like, Carolyn, our CEO mentioned, is like when you play games together like especially story driven game a lot of time uh, maybe it's a gamer like maybe the husband or boyfriend they're playing and then the 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 partner is like, sitting next to it shouting oh maybe we should make the other choice i mean mm. like a lot of time it's like of because like that's the beauty about story because you can always have your opinion that are different with other. So, I mean, like the way that when you're playing a story-driven game, you could be like having your own idea about like, oh, you should pick the other choice. Um, and then that is the fun about it, that how the discussion can work and then bring in your own opinion. Uh, so when we have at Dust4, we say we want it to be a multiplayer game because we want it to be something that people can share together. Um, 
I think the difficult thing is about like number of player. I mean, like in the beginning, we talk about like two player, four player, and then we end up with eight player. <laughs> and then eight player is kind of the thing that we thought, oh, we can do eight player. Why not? <laughs> so is um, yeah. we do that. Uh, but there's definitely a lot of challenge about like, how we manage to mix online multiplayer and local multiplayer because from a designer point of view, you got like the 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 different user story, how different number of people can play together, and then also like UI challenge. I think the one of the really big challenge for us is like because as we say, we allow player to play with controller, we allow pay, player to play with their mouse keyboard, and then also the phone apps. So it means that on the UID side, we need to cater for whatever button people mm. want to use, and also different way device. So I think that was a really challenging things so how we communicate it. That's why we have like keeping that you can like for example a button that for QTE we only say press the button because you want them to be able to press any button. Mm. Um, but that's the challenge is like people will say, why is not our A button or the UI? Because we can't just do A button uh, or X button. Um, but yeah, but I think it's definitely a good decision to go for something like multiplayer because I think it shared the passion and the value for, for our team. I'm just curious, like, do you have data, like how many hours of the gameplay, like, of uh, as Dark Force are actually played in multiplayer mode versus single player mode. Don't worry if you don't have the num answer mm. off the top of your head. Yeah, I don't think I have the number, but it's like how still fair bit. I mean, is I mean, to be honest, I think like the single player is still the biggest. Mm -hmm. I think because I think it's a it's a common thing about like because it's a story game. A lot of people want to make their own choice. Um, but there's still quite a share bit of like, people playing multiplayer. Um, we kind of like trying to encouraging multiplayer by providing them more like control diff method. We really want to get into uh, kind of like helping the game, the person, the player who normally don't play game to play our game. Um, but yeah, it's definitely something that we want to look at and then see how can we kind of like make them even better and more people playing it. Yeah, you are. I'd like to ask the same question of you though, because Whispers in the West is really exciting. I remember when we first met and I was like, I'm kind of worrying the team going, well, we're making something a bit different here and no, no one's really explored <laughs> the space. They're meeting you and going, oh, oh no, oh, someone else is doing something and it's really clever. That moment of, oh no, and then the moment of, oh, actually it's really interesting. Could you talk a bit about why you chose this area, why narrative, and what was the inspiration behind it? Yes, uh, certainly. So uh, as I mentioned, my background is in board games. So I like playing games with friends and uh, and I totally agree with May, like the social elements really add to, really provide like a whole new di dimension to the game experience. And uh, yeah, so, um, also, Rachel asked like whether we are into tabletop RPGs. I guess as a board game producer or avid board game player, I certainly um, played quite a lot tabletop RPGs. Although I admit I'm not one of the hardcore D and D gamers, mo mostly because I really don't have a lot of time to play. <laughs> but uh, one of my favorite uh, board game is uh, Betrayal of the House on the Hill. So, which for for those who who know this uh, know about this board game, it's it's a lot of like, I think it 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 gives you a lot of uh, table traditional tabletop RPG feeling, but um, at the same time, it's a lot shorter. Like each game is about one or two hours long, and uh, that 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 length, I think, is a kind of optimal length. Like uh, in Whispers in the West, we want to aim for as well because it's an online co-op kind of party game. I, I like to play uh, games with my friends, but I'm also conscious I cannot uh, ask my friends to, to stay in front of the computer to play with me for five hours, right? So 
um, we have to we kind of like have to limit the the length of the game. Um, so Whisper in the West basically is a, a point of game, point and click game uh, that supports online co-op. So it's set in the Wild West and uh, um, each player can choose a role, for example, a sheriff or a cowboy, and then they need to work together to solve a mystery case. And uh, we introduced something, um, it's like a time limit. So uh, with this time limit, it encourages the, the players to actually maybe split up to gather as info as much information as they can by talking to different NPCs to inspect different clues, and uh, they have to uh, piece together this uh, fragmented information together in order to solve this puzzle. Uh, in in order to solve the mystery case, mm -hmm. um, because of the time limit, they are encouraged to communicate with each other. So. Um, we also we also did a lot of uh, we, we did open uh, development, which means we from the beginning of the project we uh, we never keep it as a secret. We review as much info information on the in as possible on the internet, and we invite uh, external players, streamers to come in to try the game. So um, so far we 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 only released a demo last year, but we already have actually quite a few Twitch streams, which you can find online. Um, one of the uh, streamers actually dubbed our game as the game that you talk louder over each other. So <laughs> <laughs> that describes like the, the kind of intensity of the debate or discussion the players have over the course of the game, because uh, they, they, they have this time limit and they need to solve the case. And uh, sometimes, like one player find maybe find a clue somewhere else, and they desperately want to communicate, get this information across to to other players. And uh, whereas at the same time, um, maybe another player also find some important clues, and uh, they constantly need to change this, exchange this information, and uh, try to solve the mystery together. Did you have to design any? F oh, sorry, Richard, I'm over. No, just to sorry, I was going to say, would this work as a board game? Could you make a board game using this? I could, I guess, but um, <laughs> as as I played many board games, I Richard, if you uh, want a board game experience similar to this, this is this is also actually already one called Chronics of Prime. Um, I'm actually in uh, or. I actually know the designer of the, this game. We always have good conversations together. Um, I highly recommend uh, this board game as well. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, I'll have to make a note then. <laughs> yeah. Actually, when this game comes out, it's kind of really inspiring. I think it came out around 2019. And it's a board game that you you have those kind of little tokens as well, as board games have, but also it comes uh, comes with a mobile app. In the mobile app, you need to scan those QR codes, so scan those tokens, and the, the story actually lives. The stories actually live in this mobile app. Oh, okay, nice, like a mixed media thing. What was the name again, one more time? Uh, sorry, it's called uh, Chronicles of Crime. It's, it's either Chronicle of Crimes or Chronicles of Crime. I never okay, remember crime. the exact name. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. So did you have to rethink any part of your designs or your features to, to, to support this communication between your players and development? Yes, absolutely. And uh, um, for example, one of the f uh, very little features like players really like, uh, but it's really a little thing for us to do was uh, um, for the player to be able to ping a dialogue. For example, if you are talking with an NPC and there's a very important piece of information you think uh, comes up, there is a kind of like a pinging button. You can ping this button so all the other, all other players uh, get a notification. Okay, this, this, there is an important piece of dialogue. Maybe you should, you should take note. Um, mm. This 
um, interestingly, this feature first came up as an accessibility feature because one of the early streamers of our game um, had some uh, he hearing difficulty. So it's for, from my understanding, it can be quite difficult for her to hear the exact words that her teammates talked about. So as a small team, we were super agile. We basically implemented this feature like in one day. And it's like in the morning, I told the team, OK, we, we have this player uh, who may have some special needs, what we can do about it. And in the evening, because they are based in the States, it's time for them to stream the game. We already have this uh, fresh, freshly baked feature on Steam for, for, Great. for her. <laughs> the joys of modern development, huh? Um, in fact, to be fair, it was a question to ask Richard very quickly there. Did you play test um, with MUD? Obviously, going back to MUD, was playtesting a big part of the development of it? Was it more of a, hey, let's put this thing out there and see how it does? Or did um, you actively seek feedback as you built it? No, we just we um, we started building it. People came along, but we were building it. And as they were coming along, the world was coming around them. Um, people would have ideas. Of course, everybody thinks their idea is the one in the 5% that isn't rubbish. So we'd write um, some of them down, some of them got implemented, some of them went on the list, and sometimes you went down the list and actually implemented some of the things in there. But um, it, it was uh, it was all um, authorial. Uh, um, Roy had um, authorial control um, for the first two years, and then I took over at um, like Easter 1980. Mm. Uh, but the, the thing is that um, you've, you've, your game's got to have... Uh, uh, if it's a text game uh, that's talking to the players, which is what uh, a mud, mud does, or any text game really, it's got to have a voice and it's got to have a, um, a personality. So you've got to make sure that when it is um, telling people what to do and how and what the results of their actions are, that it's all consistent and coherent. Uh, so, so although we did, a, um, we started out by letting players add their own content. That soon got taken out because the players were adding things which really you didn't want in a in a game. Uh, so, uh, but it was all it was all learning. But we just built everything around it. Uh, then we kept rewriting it from scratch. Um, the the one that became best known from which the others most of the others virtual worlds descend was called well it was called mud, but mud became. Um, the generic term for the whole thing they're all called muds so people retrofitted and called it mud one like the origin mud but uh, we never called it mud one but uh, that's what it was called then then when i rewrote it again for a um uh, another uh, a version, uh, the fourth version was called mud two um mm. i just thought oh, well you, you, whatever the players call something that's what it's called so yeah <laughs> You, you can't fight this. There's just too many. There's too many of them. So um, we, we, we did that. The, the MUD 2, um, again, it was all incremental. Things were being added. Um, these days, uh, in a in a full-on MMO, um, things are added um, uh, in formal patches with groups of things. Now, I would do that back in the old days. I did used to release things with release notes this is all the changes that i've made um in the game from the last thing um emergency patches were really easy to make because um i could just do them straight away when we didn't have to roll out over hundreds of servers uh but the um most of the things that were put in would stick but sometimes there would be oh, unforeseen consequences uh that, um or consequences that uh, should have been foreseen that weren't um, so we made changes um, to those um, overall um, it was uh, the um, the play testing was that was playing we didn't have a separate uh, development server we well I had one at home but it was just me playing my own you know so I was testing all my stuff and then um, putting it out into the world but um, it's it's in some, in many ways, it's easier in text because the you don't have all the interface problems that you get with um, with the graphical world. And these days, with all the different machines, and as, as May was saying, all the different uh, 
user interface things if for playing on a console, a, a controller, or on a keyboard, or on a phone. And they're all they've all got different things, and you end up having to play to the intersection of them all, which can can be frustrating. Uh, but uh, text games still are played quite a bit. The um, uh, blind community um, can play them because they can read Braille. In fact, they can read Braille faster than sighted people can read with their sight. Um, so uh, there's still that around. And it's also very good for people with, diff with strong imaginations because they project what they want to see. <coughs> Sorry. The, the, yeah. yeah, the problem with them is that nobody will play them because they see text and think, blah, that's... <laughs> it's something that all of us fight against, yes. you know. It, it's funny how much the imagination can be pushed. When I, when I worked on Fallen London, players would come up with these fantastically imaginative backgrounds for their characters, which really were mostly just text. Mm. The artwork was very good artwork, was, was very simplistic. Kind of the joy of then combining that when you play it as a group, when you're playing in a guild or in a team is then you share that experience with each other and they imbibe it with a bit of the personality and choices people comment on what you do well, right? i don't know if you've we, we, in in not known in mud we didn't do that so much in mud but in many of the role-playing games that um were specifically created for role players people used to have well some some of them you had to write up an essay to say what your character's background was but what they found was when players were describing themselves in words um, a lot of them would describe similar characters. So a lot of the male characters were tall, thin, dark, but um, showing an unmistakable veil of power. And a lot of the female players were red-haired with a turn-up nose and freckles and green eyes. Um, and, yeah, OK, you know, they're, they're clones. Everybody, uh. they're, they're all having the same, <laughs> same visions of themselves. Uh, but... Um, with a, with a graphical world, you can, at least you can make characters that look different uh, mm. and present differently, and you can um, that gives you something to hang a personality off. Uh, we just had a name, and we also had gender, but we wouldn't have had that if the English language hadn't forced it on us. Yeah, no fair. Mm. Uh, May, are you going? Oh, sorry, you please. Sorry, <laughs> so I just want to mention that uh, apart from. Um, being known for um, Matt, Richard also known for, I think, called Bartos theory or Bartos player types. Mm -hmm. um, this is something uh, obviously came came out, came out a while ago, and uh, I heard about it uh, at least ten years ago. Um, actually, I always wanted to ask Richard this question: like, as time passes, do you think your you have the the idea of the player types have have been shifted in your in your opinion um okay so i'm an academic so i only ever say things that i can back up and player types works for massively multiplayer online play role-playing games for people who are playing those games for fun i can explain why they would but we don't have enough time and may is wanting to say something so but the um uh, if you apply it to other things like regular computer games it seems to work for that lots of people use it but i make no claims that it would work for that um you know the, the guarantee doesn't work for that but you know it's like using a um a, a two a flat screwdriver in a four screwdriver hole you know it'll work there might be a better screwdriver and i'm sure people are going to find a better <laughs> screwdriver but at the moment um <laughs> If this is all you've got, well, that's what you use. Um, I, it still works, um, and I still believe it, and it still explains a lot why things happen in virtual worlds, and um, I would still suggest virtual world designers were at least appraised of it. Um, there are other ones that people will look at, but um, which are classifications. Um, Nikki's is very good, um, for example. Um, and lots of developers use that. The, the, what um, player types has is that it's not something that you can um, really, um, you can't do it, ob look at it observationally. You can't say this person's speaking a lot, therefore they must be a socializer, 
because that well anybody could be a killer you know they'll, they'll hide things just to just so they could be a jerk later on um you can't say this person um is doing all these quests so they must be an achiever because they could be an explorer who's doing the quests mm. reluctantly just to get to the point where they can mm -hmm. do what they really want to do um so it's, it's going on in players heads so it's, it's actually quite hard to prove that it doesn't work so i'm, I'm on good ground there but yeah certainly we've seen it working in king of the castle um in particular when uh noble players who vote and but don't get to choose the events and don't get to they get a limited input uh, particularly the explorers are really pushing against that and saying i really want you to vote for something else or do something else and the crowd kind of carries them off and normally the killers win the day by overturning the system and setting the whole thing on fire <laughs> Um, so it definitely, for record, Richard, if you want to use it as a test piece, yep, I think he could apply it to King of the Castle, so hey, there's one that it works for. Yeah, it's really inspiring. Yeah, it's really inspiring, Richard. It's like how, how you come up with like that everything when you, 10 years ago, it's really cool. I think the thing that I was wanting to mention when you guy was talking was about like play testing. Oh, as I say, I want to mention is such an important piece for at Dust Fold, especially for. So we do two type of uh, play testing. One is like our more mechanic about multiplayer, about how of everything work control. But the other side was like I'm like more like story test. It's like how is the story logical or any hold that we can pick out. But from the player, multiplayer point of view, it's like it's such a different when we do like two player tests or four player tests or single player tests is like because of different dynamic is it we learn so much from that to able to like have say two player most of the people like how we can categorize type of game session and targeting it with like different gameplay element so it, it's interesting you say that because we're a very tiny team a very very small team which i don't think people always realize when they ask us to make a single player version and we go well uh, there's yeah. not many of us to do it uh we did about six different types of play testing um in the end uh we do small groups large groups we do web sizes but one of the scariest things is we had a had a bit of a a tough old run towards launch lots of things happened including our announced day was the day the queen died and our trailer, which had a king's head on a spike, had to be pulled very quickly. Oh, that was no. that was fun. That really threw a spanner in the works. Um, but one of the things we didn't know until we entered our early access was how this game is going to work with 6,000 players. And indeed, on day one, one Twitch streamer jumped in and started playing and 6,000 people joined. We'd done load testing and... We have bots that run the game. Well, not quite bots. You couldn't turn them into bots. They just automatically play the game. We can run through events faster. The one thing that we could never design for was for human behavior. And even now, we're still working on, you know, listening to feedback and reading around it. But uh, yeah, if you lot want scary, I'll give you launching a game which says, yeah, we'll do 6,000 players, despite you only having having tested that in a very safe environment. It worked <laughs> perfectly. So kudos to my engineers, who are just wonderful, brilliant developers who made it work. Yeah, cool. um, sounds really cool. Um, yeah, I just want to echo that I can't appreciate how, I can't say how much I appreciate playtest. It's the single best thing about developing a multiplayer game because it forces you to go to go out to reach out to players, to reach out to playtesters, and uh, we we take we approach playtests slightly differently instead of like. Um, um, trusting a third-party company find playtesters to us, we uh, we find playtesters directly ourselves, and we still do regular playtest sessions uh, on average twice a week, and uh, we learn so much from our players. And uh, um, every session, because we have direct communication with them, we can see what they enjoy about the game, what makes him what makes them laugh and uh, what makes them feel frustrated and uh, it has been the most important um, develop mm. uh, method that that we use um, during the journey. Sorry Richard, yeah. did you want to say something? 
No, no, I was just going to say we're running out of time. Um, and <laughs> so I was wondering if there's um, anything that anybody was uh, wanting to add that they hadn't brought up that they really yeah. wanted to bring up. Yeah, I think for at Dust 4, I think we were really lucky to have Xbox to help us to test the game as well. Um, and also they are really helping us to look at the accessibility side. So we do have like kind of like a lot of like features set for the disability society. So I mean like the game is fully playable when you have no sight. Um, so I think that was a really big thing for us to be able to have the game that accessible for everybody and able to because I think game is for everyone. So I think that was a key thing for me is a multiplayer that game that can bring everyone together with really low barrier to entry. I have one very quickly to add, which is that, yeah, I've really enjoyed this conversation. I think I could keep it going for another two hours. We've only just scratched the <laughs> surface of social narrative. I mean, I think we could have got a lot deeper. What I wanted to say was that it is an extremely exciting space to be in right now. You know, we talk about Twitch as being this new thing, but it's just the current medium which we move through to make narrative games that multiple people can play. And I really hope we're at the start of that. I certainly base my studio around that and then things that we'll be working on next will be in that area. But what I also wanted to say was that we all talked about playtesting here, yes, and, and the players doing sometimes naughty things, but the overwhelming thing being that the people in the narrative space are wonderful. We have this group of magical, incredibly passionate fans who create the content that we've talked about, create the fan fiction they talked about, vote the game up high enough that I have to do a stream in a maid outfit, like I promised them. Like, you really can't ask for more, <laughs> right? Like. And it's really exciting to see other people get excited, as excited as I am, to create cooperative, sometimes competitive stories. Um, so long way it live, and thanks to the players. Cheers, you lot. Appreciate it. Any more final comments? Yo, you. Well, yeah, same here. And I can't believe how fast this past the 40 or 45 minutes passes by, or even a little more, actually. Um, it really has been a really good conversation with all of you. Um, I, I think some final words I want to say is that I think the, uh, Sam, Sam mentioned the conversation we had, uh, I think, September last year, when we kind of found each other, both may, make uh, very niche social <laughs> narrative games. <laughs> that was... Um, that, that actually gave me the idea of putting together this, this panel. So thank you, Sam, for reaching out. And, uh, and, uh, and to Richard as well, as I actually mentioned uh, once publicly as well, um, in our, one of our game's early prototypes, we actually uh, developed a Discord bot, which plays basically the GM of our murder mystery game, which essentially is a mod. <laughs> And I right. think, um, like, like, like Richard just mentioned, like, because of the pure text format, which removes all the, uh, possible, like, e the, all the possible issues to do with graphics, with interaction, it's just uh, so much easier to fast the prototype. And I'm also very grateful that we live in, a, in this world, like, it's probably much, much easier for us to whip up something like a Discord board than back in the days when Richard and, uh, uh, and his friends building the first version of MUD. Um, and the May as, as well, um, actually, I, I knew May uh, through the process of putting together this, this panel. Um, I came across as Dusk4 uh, um, from a talk um, by Caroline, the founder of Interonite. Um, it, it's, it's great to see so many inspiring women in this space and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure there will, there will be more conversation coming in the future. Cracking. Yeah, it's um, very cool. Yeah.
Richard? No, me, me? No, no. I thought we. I thought that. I thought that was <laughs> yeah, a good no, end. No, I thought no, we no, just we finished there. It was a good <laughs> end. No, 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 I haven't really got any, like, anything to add. I don't think um, so. Yes. Cracking. Okay, we'll wrap this up. Shall I do a little outro? I'll do a little outro. I'm noisy. Thank you, everyone, for watching. Thank you to you three coming here as well. It's been lovely chatting with you all. Enjoy the rest of Ludo Naricom, and we'll see you soon. Bye.